We'll start a new topic today, and that is contrition. Contrition is defined as regret for having sinned. It comes from a word which means to crush in Latin. Break. It indicates a state of soul which is torn apart and penetrated with a sorrow for having offended God. So it's a detestation of the sin. And it desires ardently to reconcile with God. So that's a part of it. So there's a sort of a negative part, which is the detestation of the sin. And then there's a, we might say, a positive part, which is the desire to reconcile with God. The Council of Trent defines contrition as a sorrow of the soul and a detestation of the sin committed with an intention to sin no more in the future. This contrition must be accompanied by a desire to accomplish everything which our Lord commanded for the remission of sins. And consequently, it must be accompanied by an intention to confess the sins and to satisfy for divine justice. So you have to intend to confess and intend to do the penance. Those are conditions of true contrition. There are two kinds of contrition, perfect and imperfect, and the latter is also called attrition. The motive of the first is the love of God, the goodness of God. You have offended the goodness of God. This reconciles the sinner to God even before sacramental absolution. provided you have the intention to confess at your earliest convenience. So already the soul is in the state of sanctifying grace. It is impossible that a that mortal sin uh, continue is that the state of mortal sin, the state of being uh, set against God, we might say, uh, continue in the presence of true contrition, uh, perfect contrition. They're two opposite things. And so the soul is already in the state of sanctifying grace with perfect contrition before even sacramental confession. Provided you intend to confess. The second type of contrition is imperfect contrition, the motive of, wi of which is the consideration of the turpitude of sin and or the fear of hell. So if you're essentially disgusted with yourself because you did something terrible, now that is not incompatible with perfect contrition. You should be disgusted with yourself. <laughs> it's just that if that is the motive of your contrition, merely being disgusted with yourself, that is imperfect contrition. Or the fear of hell. I don't want to go to hell, so I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. 
if it excludes the will to sin and includes the hope of pardon, it disposes the penitent to obtain mercy in the sacrament of penance. So even this imperfect contrition is the effect of the grace of God. It is not a purely natural thing. If it were, it would have no effect in the, in the supernatural order. So, but it must include the will to sin no more and the hope of pardon. So there's a supernatural hope. And that disposes the penitent to obtain mercy in the sacrament of penance, but it does not restore the soul to the state of grace before the sacrament of penance. Because it's imperfect. It needs to be perfected, you might say, by this sacrament. But it's sufficient for the sacrament of penance. So this uh, contrition, although it is imperfect, is nonetheless a gift of God. You cannot even think about your eternal salvation without actual grace. That's the general principle. You can't even think about it. St. Augustine said that our Lord wept in order that man weep for himself. And St. Pamenius, upon seeing the death of St. Arsenius, said, Happy Arsenius, for having wept for himself when he was on earth. Those who do not weep down here will weep eternally in the other life. Sacramental confession would be invalid unless the penitent be sorry for his sins. So you should always ask that. People typically tell their sins and then stop. They should say the formula for these and all the sins of my past life, I am heartily sorry. Because they have to manifest sorrow in the confession. So you have to ask, are you sorry for your sins? Oh, yes, Father. But they have to do that. You can't absolve someone merely on the presumption that they're sorry. Because some people, you might, you might have saints in your confessional and you might have people who are very, very lukewarm and uh, the, um, so they might just think all you have to do is go tell your sins. And you know, sorrow includes purpose of amendment, but you don't have to, uh, well, they, they should uh, recite their act of contrition as well, which includes the purpose of amendment. So you have them do their act of contrition inside the confessional. I think I told you that in... Detroit, there's so many Polish people in Detroit that you occasionally would get the act of contrition in Polish. And as I said, they could be reciting their grocery, grocery list as far as I was concerned. I mean, <laughs> but you sort of knew who they were and they were pious people. I don't think they would recite their grocery list in Polish. Yes. It, you have to know that they are sorry for their sins. I mean, they have to declare their sorrow. Otherwise, you're presuming it. And you're not supposed to do that.
In his justice, God cannot pardon sins without regret for having committed them. See, it would be contrary to his justice. It would be you know, just to overlook the sins of men, to forget about them. Just say, you're off the hook. Just as it would be wrong for a judge in a court to exonerate someone who was not sorry. You know, I shot that woman in the face and she deserved it. And if I had an opportunity again, I would shoot her again 10 times in the face. <laughs> well, there are people like that. I mean, there's some hardened criminals. If a judge were to say, well, that's all right. You can go. We forgive you. See, so there has to, even though you know, mercy and justice are in a certain way opposed, mercy presupposes justice. That is, there has to be a certain justice in mercy. And for if the if the criminal said, "Oh, I'm ter terribly sorry," and I'm I'm in tears and uh, prostrated himself on the floor in front of the judge and just said, "You know, I I deserve the death penalty, but please, please, please don't give me the death penalty." If the judge were satisfied that, that he had a, a true contrition, then you have a cause for mercy. See, there's a certain justice in mercy. St. Bernard said in his usual poetic way, the tears of the sinners are the wine of angels. St. John Chrysostom points out that contrition alone takes away sin. It is not the same for other sorrows. If you have lost all your money, your regret does not get your money back. Let's say you've spent it on gambling. You take $100,000 and blow it in one night in Las Vegas. And then you come back, you've, you've blown all of your money. There's no, you have no money left. You think, oh, oh, I wish I had not done that. That was a terrible thing to do. That doesn't give you your money back. You're contrite for having spent all that money. It doesn't do anything to bring it back. And the sorrow over the loss of a loved one, he says, <clears throat> to death, does not bring that person back to life. Or someone may injure you and you are deeply saddened, but your pain will not take away the injury that you have received. If you get stabbed or shot. But your regret of your sins destroys the sins. So it's the only case where regret restores life and and grace so when you when tears fall on your faults he says they are washed away by deploring the insane audacity which made us lose the the sanctity of our baptism we prepare our, for ourselves a new baptism. So penance is really an extension of baptism in, in that sense. It's, it's to restore the effects of baptism. The compunction of the heart and tears are a new baptism, St. Bernard says. He also says that the sincere sorrow for having sinned is an infinitely desirable treasure. And it places in man a joy that he cannot express. Uh, 
That's true, especially people who have sinned a great deal, who have been away for a long time. Away from confession, etc., the sacraments. It, it's, there's, it's a very joyful thing for them. Psalm 50 says, the, that's the Miserere, which you'll say about a hundred times during Holy Week, Sacrificium Deo Spiritus Contribulatus, a sacrifice to God is a contrite spirit. Cor contritum et humiliatum Deus non despicias, a contrite and humble heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. That's David's famous psalm, <clears throat> of contrition over his adultery. God bless you. And it's said at the end of every hour in the sacred triduum, every hour of the breviary. Miserere me. So you, you, I think you'll be practicing that soon. <laughs> St. Jerome said, O happy sorrow, which attracts the eyes of God. Now the riches of compunction are these. First, it is holy and reconciles the soul with God, which is the source of immense happiness. I mean, there's really nothing else to desire than to be reconciled with God. If you're an enemy of God by sin, you have some very serious problems, the most serious problem you could possibly have. Two, it comes from the love of God since the penitent is sorry for having sinned because he sees how much God is a great good and how much he is lovable in himself and towards all of his creatures. So that's concerning perfect contrition. <clears throat> so the only true joy of the soul is love of God. Because, as I, as I said in previous conferences, because of the depth of the soul, as St. Augustine said, our, our um, hearts were made for thee and will not rest until they rest in thee. Very famous quotation of St. Augustine. So it, it springs from the love of God. Three, the penitent wants to repent and is joyful about it. The regret of having sinned is sweet and humble, whereas every other regret is bitter. So if you've spent all your money in Las Vegas, that's a bitter regret. Or if you have invested your money foolishly. That's why, uh, you know, when the stock market crashed in 1929, there were a lot of suicides on Wall Street. People opened the window and jumped out. It was a lot. They lost everything. That's when there were still windows in buildings. There was no air conditioning. St. Bernard says, a culpable conscience is the hell and the prison of the soul.
there's nothing worse than a, a, a bad conscience, that is, an accusing conscience. And there's nothing better than a clear conscience. All the gold in the world cannot buy the testimony of a good conscience. That I have done nothing wrong, or if I have, I have reconciled with God and with my neighbor. That's a clear conscience. All of the money in the world cannot buy that interior peace. For contrition gives hope of eternal beatitude. It is the pledge of celestial joy. <clears throat> it's a foretaste of heaven. So it, it essentially opens up heaven. All right, we um, said yesterday that uh, what St. Bernard said, a culpable conscience is the hell uh, and the prison of the soul. The fourth good effect of uh, contrition is that it gives the hope of eternal beatitude. It is the pledge of future glory. It is a foretaste of the of future joy in heaven. The fifth good effect of contrition is that it pleases God, the angels, and all the elect. There's the famous quote from St. Luke, chapter 15, verse 7, what our Lord said, Ita gaudium erit in celo super uno peccatore penitentiam agente, quam super non agenta novem justis, qui non indigent penitentia. So that means there is more joy in heaven over one sinner doing penance than over 99 just who are not in need of penance. Some walking through the hall. Uh, so, um, which is a beautiful quotation. So it it pleases God by by our Lord's own own testimony. That gospel, by the way, occurs on the fourth Sunday after Pentecost which happens to be the Sunday within the octave of Pentecost. Every year it's the Sunday within the octave of Pentecost. And, uh, excuse me, within the octave of the Sacred Heart. So it's a perfect <laughs> gospel for the Sacred Heart, but the Sacred Heart displaces that gospel. Uh, but you could preach on it. It's, it's a very n appropriate thing for that gospel. I always remember that you're, you're seeing, saying that gospel at the end, and I think you never get to preach on that gospel because you're preaching on the Sacred Heart. But it's very appropriate. So, and number six. Uh, for the good effects of contrition, it obtains for the sinner peace and the pardon of all his sins. It sends away the devil. It closes hell. It provides victory over Satan, the world, and concupiscence. So it, it is a, a, a tremendous victory for God, you might say. The, the glory of God is accomplished in this world by the salvation of souls. And so just as all creation glorifies God by operating as it should, so the physical laws, the, the instincts of animals and plants and so forth, all of the programming glorifies God. All of it is operating as it ought to. And that's an accidental glory of God because his glory is perfect in, in himself. But he created 
the world and the, the whole universe for the purpose of manifesting his glory. And that's how it manifests its, his glory. So the way it, we manifest the glory of God and how we contribute to the glory of God is by one thing, and that is the salvation of, of souls. That is by rectifying the problem of sin and getting ourselves or others to act as God wills them to act according to his law. See, so that, that, that's the single way in which we can contribute to the glory of God. See, so that's why becoming a priest or a religious is the best possible way in which to contribute to the glory of God. Because not only are you, I hope, saving your own soul and, and progressing toward a perfect state, but also you are saving the souls of many other people. That's true of priests primarily, but also religious, of whether male or female, who help priests to accomplish that work. See, so that the, you, know, you, you should meditate on the purpose of your existence, the purpose of existence of every single thing that exists in the universe. And that is the glory of God. And the best way to accomplish that for any human being is to help in that goal of, of glorifying God through the salvation of souls. St. Paul said, this is the will of God, your sanctification, period. Very simple. So, you know, we can't really please him in any other way. We, you know, we can't give him money or what does he need from us? Anything we have, he owns already. It's like a, a child who asks his mother for money in order that she can buy, that he can buy her a gift. <clears throat> I need money, so I want to buy you a gift. That's what it is. That's how helpless we are. He owns everything. So there's nothing we can do for him. But by his own plan, this is, this is how he is glorified. So it's this victory over Satan. You see, the, the crucifixion is the victory over the devil and the releasing of human beings from the thraldom of the devil. Thraldom in French would be empire. All right. So, the, but we return to the thraldom of the devil by mortal sin. And so the, the contrition is this enemy of mortal sin. It is also the enemy of Satan. It restores the victory of Christ in the soul. And it, it, it's a conquest over the world and concupiscence as well. St. Dominic said the greatest victory uh, that a man can achieve is the victory over himself. And it opens heaven and it leads to heaven. So what is more joyful than that somebody on his deathbed should be of contrite heart and should make a confession and receive the sacraments? Even if he has sinned very, very greatly, if he has been away for 50 years or more. So where there is contrition and humility, there is no more perversity, no more degradation. Rather, perfect order reigns. It, it, it orders the soul, and the heart is filled with good things. So it's a wonderful thing, contrition. On the other hand, where there is the absence of contrition, 
everything is upside down, deranged, ravaged, and annihilated. So the, the state of the soul in mortal sin is, is it's like looking at the Roman Forum, a once magnificent place full of... When you go to Rome, you look at the Roman Forum, you think, oh, boy. Did you ever see pictures of the Roman Forum? I mean, it's just devastated. There's a few columns left. You know. But it's a, it's a picture of the, of the soul in the state of mortal sin. It, once a great thing, and then pff, just ruins. And that's what St. Gregory said when he was criticized for not having stopped the fires that did all that damage. Uh, he said, this is a symbol of God's, uh, I'm not, this is not a quote, but God's wrath toward the Romans for the persecutions of the Christians. That it is a good and right thing that that thing lay in ruins as a testimony of the, of the corruption of Rome. That's what St. Gregory the Great said about it. Because there was a big fire during his reign and he was criticized for that, that he, you know, that he just let that forum go to pieces. It was mostly temples to pagan gods, most of it. And I don't know if you, you know, but the, the doors of St. John Lateran come from the curia in the forum, the, the, the big bronze doors, and the magnificent side altar uh, with the, the gilded columns of solid bronze. I mean, these things are probably at least 20 feet tall, at least. Solid bronze, gilded. Come from the Temple of Jupiter. It's, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's a side altar <laughs> in St. John Lateran. <laughs> I mean, if you saw that altar, <laughs> you know, that, that's the, uh, when I first went to Rome, I, I was, so impressed by what they consider side altars. <laughs> Something you would just say, this is the most beautiful altar in, in the whole diocese, you know, and, and it's a side altar in Rome. So, um, but that's, uh, that's where they keep the Blessed Sacrament. They always did. In the major churches, you would always keep the Blessed Sacrament in a side altar, not, not poked into the wall the way they do now, but in a, an altar that is off the main altar. And the reason for that is that the, uh, as you know, we have to take the Blessed Sacrament out. Uh, because for the big ceremonies, the p big papal or Episcopal ceremonies, the, the main altar should not have the Blessed Sacrament on it. So typically you would walk into a big cathedral and you wouldn't see a tabernacle on the altar. Th that was quite normal because, again, the, all of the references to the, the bishop or to the pope in that case would be incompatible to the references, references that need to be given to the Blessed Sacrament. So there's a side chapel in St. Peter's Basilica uh, designed by Bernini. That was always true. That's the famous quotation of Pius X. He was in St. Peter's Basilica and he saw a sacristan walk by the side chapel without genuflecting. We saw somebody walk by the side chapel without genuflecting because it's on the side he was walking up. And he said, that man is either an atheist or a sacristan. <laughs> <laughs> because sacristans get so used to running around a church and, you know, that, that they may neglect to genuflect from time to time. But that's what he said. He was... Uh, had the reputation for being extremely humorous, St. Pius X, or saying very funny things. He would go around as Cardinal uh, of Venice and walk around and then pop in on priests for dinner. Like, there's a knock on the door at a rectory, and it's the Cardinal. But he, was, he put them so much at ease that he would just sit down and eat with it, whatever they were eating. And they said that like, he was extremely funny with that. He said very, very funny things. That's, what, that's related of Pius X. So he would uh, do that. Just He always kept a good relationship with his priests because he was effectively a parish priest. I mean, that was his... He never really stopped being a parish priest. And uh, so it was... Uh, um, there's some uh, humorous stories connected with him. 
Um, and the, when he was in the garden, for example, uh, this was shortly after he was raised to the pontificate. He was walking in the in the Vatican gardens, and they had all these guards around him. And he said, now I know what our Lord felt like when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> so, in Psalm 125, verse 5 and 6, it says, they that sow in tears, I mean sow in this way, you know, seed, shall reap in joy, going they went and wept, casting their seeds, but coming they shall come with joyfulness, carrying their sheaves. The sheave is the, what you, the carrying the, the bunch of grain on your shoulder. That's known as a sheaf in English and sheaves in the plural. And in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, but to, whom I shall, but to whom shall I have respect, but to him that is poor and little. Now, respect here means to whom shall I cast my, my look, or to whom will, whom will I look at? That's the sense of that. But to him that is poor and little, and of a contrite spirit, and that trembleth at my words. Now there are four qualities of, of contrition. You should probably have learned this in your catechism. And that is that it must be interior, supernatural, sovereign, and universal. So interior, supernatural, sovereign, universal. So let's look at interior first. Contrition must proceed from the depths of the heart and not come merely from the mind or memory. So we say the heart. The heart is essentially the will. And usually it means the will as it is connected to the emotions. But essentially it means the will. Because obviously the heart as an organ cannot have contrition. So where your heart is, etc., that means where, what you love. See, so it's a perfectly legitimate thing to say. The thing is your, your heart beats faster for what you love. See, so that's why it's, it's you know, it, that's, you know, that's why there's heart-shaped uh, candy boxes at Valentine's Day, see, because the, 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 the heart responds to fear, it responds to all sorts of, it responds to sadness. You know, people die of a, of a broken heart. Um, it responds to all kinds of things that are going on in your, uh, in your perceptions. Anger, it makes the, that's why people that, who get angry get heart attacks. They, they, uh, it may, makes the blood vessels constrict around your heart. So if you're constantly angry, you're constricting those blood vessels. And eventually you get a heart attack. So stress. See, so your heart is a reflection of your will and, and your perceptions, etc. So in that sense, it's called the heart. So it must proceed from the depths of the heart and not come merely from the mind or memory. So there has to be a conversion of the will. St. Bernard said this, they, uh, commenting on a psalm, they loved to weep and they wept bitterly. They wept bitterly because they repented bitterly. And in Latin that is, it comes out, very, very nicely in this way. See, amare means to love in Latin. It also is the adverb of amarus, which means bitter. So amare also means bitterly. Now watch how he did it in Latin. Bitterly. 
Amabad Flere. They loved to weep at Flebant Amare. And they wept bitterly. But notice how he, he, he does that. Amare flebant quia amare dolebant. They wept bitterly. Yes. Quia amare dolebant. They, they had sorrow bitterly. Dolere. They, they uh, repented bitterly. You know, with all these quotes of saints that I give you, you should keep a notebook of them because saint quotes are great in sermons. Right. Anything you see in the bulletins and all that, keep a record of those. <laughs> Wait till you have to preach sermons. You'll be looking for everything you can get your hands on. Like they tell you on Saturday afternoon, oh, by the way, you're preaching tomorrow. St. Peter uh, wept bitterly, it says. That's exactly flebat uh, amare, uh, after his denial of our Lord. And St. Mary Magdalene wept bitterly for her sins. The evil of sin is in the heart, and it is not found any place else. It is the heart that sins, and therefore it is in the heart that contrition must be found. So it must be interior. In Joel chapter 2, verse 13, it says, Shindite corda vestra, that means rip your hearts. Et non vestimenta vestra, and not your clothing. You see that... The Jews, the, the constant problem with the Jews was that they would observe the externals without observing the internals. And the externals were meant to inspire the internal. But they would just get attached to the external. So they would rip their garments, you know, and, 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 you know for penance. Or, you know, wow, and, and everyone would think, oh, you're doing great penance. You see? And that's, that, that problem always existed with the Jews. And that's the prophets are constantly railing against that. So, all right. So, uh, we said that contrition had to be interior. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Our Lord says, the things that proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and those things defile a man. For from the heart come forth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false testimonies, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. So he was responding to, uh, the again, the externalism of the Pharisees who were very, very concerned about uh, not eating certain things, or the, the, the laws, uh, dietary laws, but uh, apparently, you know, didn't care about moral issues. And, and he's saying you know, uh, that what, what defiles a man is not the dietary laws, it's, it's these moral issues. So he always showed that he had the power to do away with the old law. Like all of his comments, you know, the observance of the Sabbath and 
those, all of those things as far as, you know, what was permitted to do on the Sabbath and not permitted. Uh, he showed a, a, his authority to, to change those things. The father's called contrition, compunction of the heart. Compunction, well, the word puncture in English comes from that, and it means a, a stinging or a puncturing. See, so cum means, uh, it enforces the verb. That means really strongly puncturing. <laughs> that's, that's uh, uh, or, or stinging, or, see, that, that's the idea of compunction. So if we still retain an affection for the sin, then we have no true contrition. So it's important in the confessional, and we see that a little bit later in this, to make sure that there's no uh, affection for the sin. The uh, people sometimes might think that it is sufficient merely to confess that, well, you know, I did this, but they, there's, that, that's where it stops. That it's just a, like taking a shower, and well, you know, we take a shower today. Tomorrow we take another shower, and and you go to confession. You confess, and then, and then you go back to your sins, uh, and then you confess again. Uh, that's not uncommon. So you have to be certain of their moral certainty of their you have moral certainty of their uh, their contrition, their true contrition, true hatred of the sin. Order can only be reestablished in that place in which it was violated. So there is no contrition without humility and mortification of the flesh. So those are, in most cases, uh, excessive self-love. So that's humility and also sins of the flesh. In Psalm 50, which is the Miserere, Venite ador uh, cor contritum et humiliatum Deus non despicies, a contrite and humiliated heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. The second quality of contrition is that it must be supernatural. This means that it must be excited in the heart by the Holy Ghost, it must proceed from the grace of God, and founded on considerations which are furnished to us by faith. So it cannot be based merely on shame or other human considerations. The, the motive of it has to be, come from motivations that, that are supernatural. Um, so it must make us detest the sin as it is an offense committed against God. Those who are contrite because of the shame that falls upon him or the punishment that he may receive from human beings or because of the sin's opposition to the natural law is a purely natural contrition and is insufficient. The prodigal son demonstrated supernatural contrition when he said, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. And St. Peter told the Jews that they crucified Jesus Christ. And they responded, what shall we do to obtain mercy? It's in the Acts of the Apostles. And St. Peter said to do penance. And it says that 3,000 were baptized that day. So some Jews did convert, and, and quite a few of them. But as a people, or you might say most of them did not, and persecuted the church. In the early church, the, the Jews were very uh, uh, active in opposing Christianity.
Three exercises can help us obtain supernatural contrition. One, to make the stations of the cross at least mentally. You can make the stations of the cross anytime. Uh, and, um, but you could use a book with pictures in it. Or that, that would excite contrition. Or just meditate on one of the stations. Two, to descend into hell in our minds something that you deserve by your mortal sins. So die and go to hell. I mean, there's only a very thin veil that separates you from the next world. Your life is a very tenuous thing. You could killed in a car accident as 40,000 people a year are, are killed in car accidents in this country so uh, when, the, when they started out in their car they thought they would get to where they were going and then they don't they just die disease murders I mean, there's all sorts of ways in, in which you can lo use your lose your life you, you're you're body is a very complex thing and it breaks down very easily in the sense that it, you know if one significant thing goes wrong well then then you're cooked your brain uh, has a hemorrhage or your heart gives out or anything so that there's really a you know the the other side is very close in that sense So you should think about descending into hell. And third, you should contemplate heaven of which you have made yourself unworthy because of sin. And you should realize that all of that there is of pleasure and joy in this world and comfort, everything you desire from this world is a reflection of heaven. Peace, tranquility, food, that the earth produces all of it <laughs> that we eat. And those are things created by God. They are reflections of God go God's goodness. Those, those are things that really belong to heaven. The order of the universe, physical laws. That's those, all those things that we take for granted are reflections of God's perfection and they are in that sense part of heaven or you know, a foretaste of heaven. And everything that is rotten in this world is from human beings. Everything that makes us sad. Everything that... that uh, and that's a foretaste of hell. So we've got heaven and hell both running here in a way. Contrition must come from the actual grace of the Holy Ghost. The sinner, through mortal sin, kills his soul through sin. It is incapable of supernatural acts. So there's a supernatural death of the soul. And in principle, kills it forever. There's no way to come back from it, except if God draws you. like falling into the bottom of a well. So you can't rise from mortal sin except by the help of God, who is the author of life, both of natural life and of supernatural life.
Third, contrition must be sovereign. It must be a regret which surpasses every other. Because sin is the greatest of all evils. So it must be perceived as the greatest of all evils. Only sin attacks both God and the soul. In Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For great as the sea is thy destruction, who shall heal thee? He's saying that about the Jerusalem, that these, these are the Lamentations of Jeremiah, when, who stayed behind after Jerusalem was totally destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And those are sung during Holy Week. Uh, and uh, it's the lamentation of the infidelity of the Jewish people which brought down the punishment of Nebuchadnezzar upon them. And that's why he's, he's lamenting all of the, the cause of it as well, not only the destruction but the cause of it. That's why it says at the end, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, convert to your God, convert to Raya Dominum Deum Tuum. And so the, you see the, the connection in Holy Week, and that is the, that the crucifixion was their ultimate act of infidelity. And the, the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar is indicative of their souls that, that are guilty of this infidelity. an image of it. That's how that's why the lamentations are sung during that time. Saint Ambrose said, For a great wound, a powerful remedy is necessary. A great sin requires a great satisfaction. And David recognized his fault. David's fault was to lure Bathsheba into adultery, and then uh, the second fault was to kill her husband uh, in, uh, after failing to, uh, to manage to get him to stay home for a few days, uh, uh, hoping that he would not notice that the child came from David. Uh, the, uh, then he put him in the front lines against the enemy where he was sure to perish, and he did. It was Urias. So he was guilty both of adultery and murder. And that's Psalm 50 and other Psalms, but particularly Psalm 50, which is sung also during Holy Week a great deal. And he recognized his fault. He humiliated himself. He repented. He confessed. He wept. He put off the royal mantle and the diadem. He fasted. He wore a hair shirt and retired in solitude. So he did great penance for his sin. In Judith chapter 7, verses 18 to 19, there was great weeping and lamentation of all in the assembly. Now you should know the story of Judith. Holofernes was a, a Syrian general who was going to overrun all of the Holy Land, all of Israel. And he, he camped in front of a small town called Bethulia. And the uh, high priest was there and they were, uh, he was going to destroy Bethulia. And uh, so they, the high priest prevailed upon Judith, who was a very beautiful woman who was a widow uh, uh, and a noble woman, to go over to Holofernes and try to placate him, uh, not to do any harm to the Jews. 
and uh, well, you probably know the rest of the story. He was very enamored with Judith, and he had one thing on his mind, and she had something else on her mind. And uh, so he got drunk, and, and then she took his sword and cut his head off, put his head in a sack, and came back and held it up in front of the people in Bethulia. So when so that that's as the Assyrians were camped in front of Bethulia, the people felt compunction for their sins, and that's what they said. Uh, there was great weeping and lamentation of all in the assembly, and for many hours, with one voice, they cried out, cried to God, saying, "We have sinned with our fathers; we have done unjustly; we have committed iniquity." So there was a, a, an outcry of penance and contrition. And then there is the example of St. Peter who wept bitterly after his sin. And the reasoning is simple. Since God is the sovereign good, so our contrition must be sovereign. However, it is not necessary that it be the most effective of sor sorrows. Affective. It must be the most effective, but not the most affective. Effective means that it must have the effect of the complete detestation of the sin and purpose of amendment, everything you must do in order to avoid it and to hate it. Affective means that it involves the emotions. So this, of course, is necessary. This is not necessary. Sometimes people are very effective, especially saints, uh, in their contrition. St. Augustine, for example. And the reason for this is that owing to the union of body and soul, the soul is more affectively moved by sensible objects than by those which do not fall under the senses. So you might feel worse about running over a squirrel than you feel about offending God. Feel. Or some other, you know, that some other thing that might make you weep or be sad inside. That's emotion. And that is not necessary for contrition. Because God is invisible. Uh, the, 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 uh, ordinarily, he does not draw those kind of feelings. <clears throat> so it is sufficient that we be interiorly resolved by the help of God's grace to suffer all evils rather than commit a single mortal sin. So even to suffer death rather than to commit a single mortal sin. That's the essential act of contrition and purpose of amendment. An affective reaction to evil is not something which is under the control of reason. It's emotional. Contrition must be universal. It must extend to all mortal sins which one has committed without any exception. Also, venial sins. It's, you can't confess venial sins with successfully without being sorry for them you know the the 500 pound man can't come into the confessional and say oh, well i've been eating too much with the intention of going on eating the same amount of food that's keeping him at 500 pounds he has to be sorry for it see it's so be careful of that when you do, is you know, seminarians are ordinarily confessing venial sins. Make sure you're sorry for them. 
See, and it's not just, well, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. The, 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 uh, you have to be sorry for them and detest them. And, uh, otherwise, it, there's, there's no, uh, all of the absolutions in the world will not help you if you don't have contrition, whether it's mortal sin or venial sin. You have to have some contrition for it. So be careful of that, that it's not just taking the shower. <laughs> We're dumping the basket. And we must also guard against certain favorite sins. Uh, sins that we're attached to. That could be true of venial sins. Often it's true of venial sins, but uh, it could be tr true of mortal sins. And then we must also have purpose of amendment. Contrition necessarily involves this purpose of amendment. Purpose here is in the sense of resolve. It's sort of an unusual way to say purpose. It's an older way. The resolve of amendment. Very important part. It's a necessary effect of true contrition. You could not have true contrition without this effect. It's absolutely necessary in order to obtain pardon for sin. We must resolve to sin no more and to do our best to avoid sin in the future. Not to have this purpose would be to have contempt for God, it would be to abuse his mercy. So that's an important thing. You'll see in moral theology what to do with recidivists. That means people who fall into the same sins all the time. There's all sorts of rules. I'm not going to go into them right now. But you do get uh, people who are recidivists. That uh, you know, I, I robbed five banks this week. And <laughs> then, okay, you know, make sure you don't rob any more banks. And then they come back the next week. Well, I robbed five more banks this week. And almost always, in the case of mortal sin, it has to do with impurity. Because impurity is addictive. But it could be drunkenness. That's addictive too. It could be gambling. Gambling is not wrong in itself, but it's easily wrong for various reasons, peroxidens, because of the excess of it. Also, the places in which gambling is done are usually very worldly. It's just like a bar. There's nothing wrong with pouring a drink and handing it to somebody. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But bars are very typically houses of sin. So it's a peroxidens of it. It depends on the nature of the bar. But typically, uh, you know, the O'Leary's bar, where it's dark inside and there's all sorts of sleazy ladies sitting around and uh, is is bad. It has to, see peroxidens, but just serving a drink to somebody is perfectly legitimate. Same thing, taking some recreational money and betting with it for just, you know, just recreation. That's known as gaming. It's just a game. It's nothing wrong with it in itself. It's just that it's very easily uh, a sin because of excess or other things. Uh, so. But so it could be that the, the addictive sins are typically the subject of recidivism. St. Augustine said, Many frequently call themselves sinners and nevertheless still take pleasure in sinning. There is an avowal of sin, but no correction. 
The soul is accused, but not healed. The sin is declared, but it is not removed. There is no certain penance unless there is the hatred of the sin and the love of God. St. Augustine. Our Lord said to those whom he cured, or to the person he cured, uh, sin no more lest some worse thing happen to thee. That's in St. John. That's that famous case of the man who was born blind and they get his parents. St. John has always these, these excellent eyewitness accounts. He only gives seven miracles of our Lord in the whole gospel, and that's one of them. And he gives very, very detailed accounts of these. And I always thought it was amusing because the Pharisees come up to him and say, who did this? You know, and he said, well, this person over here, you know, and, and uh, his name is Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, he, he said, why do you ask? Do you want to follow him? <laughs> Which I always thought was, <laughs> I just imagine their faces when he said that. <laughs> He probably said it very innocently, but uh, you know it was—it's—it's it's just kind of amusing. But that's when he—that's what he said to the. He cured him, of course, and he said, "Sin no more, lest some worse thing happen to thee." He also said the same thing to the woman caught in adultery. Yeah, everybody uses that where he forgave the woman caught in adultery. As, well, you see, adultery is okay. He said at the end, "Go now and sin no more." They leave that out. Now, there are three signs of purpose of amendment. One is by the efforts which one makes to correct yourself. So what you do to, to correct yourself, the effort that you make. So if it's excessive drinking, you want to throw out all of the bottles. Which brings us to the second thing, the avoidance of the occasions. Part of that effort is avoidance of the occasions. So if the, the drunkard goes back to, comes out of the confessional, goes home and walks into the bar again, oh, that's an occasion of sin for him. And the same thing if people are looking at pornography on the internet, which is very common. See if they, if they don't take measures to, to counteract that. Uh, one thing you can do is have, uh, I always tell people to uh, use sticky notes. That if you, know, you have some pop-up on a page that you have is legitimate, but you have a pop-up on the side, we'll put a sticky note over it. If you hate the sin, you're going to do whatever it takes to get rid of it. If you don't hate the sin and you have a secret love for the sin, you're going to be lax with regard to the occasions. And that should be a sign to you of what's going on in your spiritual life. And then uh, the third is by changing your life. If there are changes to be made in your life, for example, to get rid of the girlfriend. Right. Some people might confess, for example, fornication with their girlfriend. Well, they at least have to resolve to abide by the rules of courtship. The Catholic rules of courtship, one is never be under the same roof alone together. Number one. So the uh, so if you're calling on a young lady, you would wait outside her apartment or wait outside her house, or if the parents are home, you go in. But if some young woman is living by herself, you don't go in. You wait. So it's a very good rule. Um, the, uh, and there used to be the practice of chaperoning, uh, which, you know, fell out of 
where s- somebody elderly would you would you know be walking along with your girlfriend and somebody's about 25 feet behind you watching you uh so you can talk and etc and, and get to know each other but there's somebody watching you that's known as the chaperone i think it's a spanish word actually uh and uh that was common in europe and it protected both parties everybody was protected See, the idea is that that uh, being alone together uh, in courtship, totally alone, totally alone, not not in your, in a park or in you know where you're, doesn't mean somebody always has to be next to you, but totally alone is is an occasion of sin, and we've completely lost all of those rules of Catholic courtship, so. At least they have to promise to do that. But if it's so bad, they might have to give each other up. You might have to require that. So especially if, they, if they're coming back a lot with that same sin, you'd have to say, you got to split. Or if somebody's involved in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an adulterous union. Right, you gotta, somebody has Fifi on the side. It's got to stop. So that it's important in the confessional to require those things. Um, whenever you deeply hate something, you naturally avoid it. So children naturally avoid certain vegetables that they hate. So you would avoid a mad dog or poison, coronavirus. <laughs> well, you see people with masks, and you know some people wear hazmat suits. You know they're avoiding what they hate. So sin is far worse than any of those things. And so you should hate sin and avoid it. Therefore. St. Gregory the Great said, He is perfectly converted who weeps over the evil he has done and laments it again by not repeating it. And St. Augustine recommends that we we remain constantly in the presence of God in order to have purpose of amendment. By the presence of God, he says, we are enlightened, purified, and made holy, God acts upon such a soul who is submitted to him and who obeys him. If we fail to do this, we fall back into sin. That's St. Augustine. All right, stop there. So we're talking about the signs of purpose of amendment. So you have to have purpose of amendment in order to be truly contrite. And there are three signs. One, by the efforts which one makes to correct oneself. Two, by the avoidance of the occasions. And three, by changing your life. So we'll look at each of these. First, by the efforts you make to correct yourself. This means subjecting the flesh to the spirit. Setting aside the world in order to be closer to God. If you fail to do these things, your resolve is weak and perhaps insincere. So it has to be a true conversion in the confessional. The Greek word metanoia. See, so, but many people go in with very weak purpose of amendment and sometimes none, that, at least no serious purpose of amendment. Two, by avoiding the occasions. 
Whenever you, and I think we said this, whenever you deeply hate something, you naturally avoid it. That is, for example, a murderer, a poison, or a mad dog. So you're going to avoid sin if you really hate it. St. Gregory the Great said, He is perfectly converted who weeps over the evil he has done and laments it again by not repeating it. And St. Augustine recommends that we remain constantly in the presence of God. By the presence of God we are enlightened, purified, and made holy. And God acts upon such a soul who is submitted to him and who obeys him. If we fail to do this, we fall back into sin. So it's not easy to stay out of sin. It's a constant battle. And it requires a great deal of strength. If you don't put in that strength and that resolve, you're going to fall into sin. And third, we must distance ourselves from the world. That's how we change our lives. So the same voice, we might say, which draws us to contrition, also calls us to flee from the world. The world is one of the sources of temptation. So if you're leading a worldly life, you're going to fall into sin. So if, you're, if your friends are all worldly and you're, you're cultivating avarice and you're going to uh, places like casinos and bars and nightclubs and leading a worldly life, you're going to fall into sin. And priests have to be careful of that, that they, they remain detached from the world, where they're, they're not uh, too involved with lay people who you know, are in the world, even if they're good lay people. If you become too involved with them and are constantly visiting them, and, and uh, you're going to become worldly. So you have to have a, a moderation with regard to those things. The penitent does not live like worldlings. He does not seek to please the world. And he is sensitive to his own evil. So he knows his weaknesses. He has a disgust for the world. It's impossible to love God and at the same time love the world. And as always, by the world, we don't mean what God created. But it means the, the whole organization of humanity, or the, 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 that, that humanity that loves the, this world and despises God. The city of man, according to St. Augustine. That's the world. 